Thanks, guys. You can go back to your seats. And um, as you go, let's uh, turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. We've had a great time in this series as we've looked at Jesus in Genesis. And next week, we'll wrap up that series. And after that, we're going to move into a series on the book of James, one of my favorites, not just because that's my name. It's just a great book uh, for our culture today. And as we move into the Christmas season, after that, I'm super, super excited about where God's going to take us during the Christmas season. Um, the book of Isaiah gives uh, several names for Jesus. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And during the four weeks in December, we're going to look at each of those names for Jesus. And what does it mean that Jesus is um, Mighty God, Wonderful Counselor? Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So I hope that you'll join us for that. I hope that you'll uh, bring people with you um, and uh, let them know that incredible, great things are going on in Glenwood Baptist Church. And I am so honored to be here with you. So Genesis chapter 3, in Adam's fall we send all. If you were a first grader in the American colonies between 1690 and 1780, you would have learned how to read using the New England Primer. It was the most successful textbook published in the 17th century, and you would have learned your ABCs with pages like this. It's hard to see up there, but uh, for A was a picture of Adam and Eve, and it said, in Adam's fall, we send all. The picture for B was, thy life to mend this book, attend. The, for the letter C, the cat doth play and after slay, but actually after the first great awakening in 1762, uh, they made it even more evangelical and C became uh, Christ crucified for sinners died. Those were the good old days, weren't they? We've kind of forgotten the idea of original sin in our culture and we probably would not see a textbook in the public schools for very long that began with, in Adam's fall, we send all. Truth is, we don't talk much about sin in our culture today at all. We talk about mistakes. We talk about um, bad decisions. But if somebody wants to talk about sin, they're usually booed off the stage. One song lyric says, there's no original sin. It's all been done before. Uh, British comedian Eddie Izzard joked one time, he said, I wanted to do an original sin, so I poked a badger with a spoon. Nobody had ever done that before, so I guess that was an original sin. But the truth is, we've all become very casual about sin if we acknowledge it at all. Up until a couple of Sundays ago, Las Vegas was proud of its designation as sin city. But what happens when Sin City has an event that our president describes as an act of pure evil? Even Las Vegas is no longer proud of being Sin City. And the truth is, can Vegas call themselves Sin City and Prattville can't? Aren't we just as much Sin City as Las Vegas, and getting it out of the news, getting it out of what you see in the media, let's talk about the darkness in our own hearts. What do you do when you know there's darkness there? Do you say it's just a mistake, it's a bad decision, or are you willing to call it what the Bible calls it, which is sin? Do we really believe that in Adam's fall we sinned all? If we believe the story of Adam and Eve, then maybe you've wondered why all of us should have to deal with something that happened in the garden thousands of years ago. Why do we still have to bear the consequences of original sin? We didn't bite the fruit, did we? Well, let's start off by looking at the instructions that were given uh, to Adam in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 God's word says, The Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. 
But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now as you look at this verse, there's a couple of things to take note of. The first might be the question that you have as parents or as, as when I was a kid, I would look at this and I would say, what's so bad about knowing, having the knowledge of good and evil? I mean, isn't that a good thing to know the difference between good and evil as a parent? Isn't that what we want for all of our children to be able to know the difference between right and wrong? Why would God prohibit them from eating of a tree that would give them that knowledge? You ever wonder? Well, understand that in this context, the meaning of knowledge of good and evil isn't about information. It's about determination. You see, God's desire is that human beings would trust Him to be the ultimate authority of what is right and what is wrong. But if Adam eats from this tree, it's going to be a rejection of God's authority to determine right and wrong and uh, an assumption of having that authority for yourself to assume your role as the final say on morality. And so the moral relativism that we face in the 21st century of everybody saying, well, what's right for you may not be right for me, and nobody's right and nobody's wrong. You all get to decide that for yourselves. That's not really anything new. That is the original sin. And here's what I want you to notice, the second thing in this context, and it's so important for what we're going to talk about in a minute. This is Genesis chapter 2. Who did God give the instructions to? Adam, the man, right? Where was Eve during this time? She hadn't been created yet. She is still a rib, okay? So Eve wasn't even on the scene, and that's so important for what's going to happen next. Look at Genesis chapter 3. God's word says the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, (laughs) you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, seeing or knowing good and evil. I want us to look at the sequence of sin. The first thing that happens is that Satan disputes God's word. First four words recorded by the serpent, by Satan, in the Bible. Did God really say? Isn't it interesting that the first four words of the Bible establish God's authority? In the beginning, God. The first four words of the serpent seek to undermine God's authority. Did God really say? That's what the devil does today. Did God really say you can't do this? Did God really say that if two people really love each other, it shouldn't matter what their gender is? Did God really say? Second thing that happens is that we distort God's word. Notice what Mama Eve says. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it. Where did God say that? Go back to Genesis 2 and find the place where God says, Do not touch it. It's not in there. You see, when we begin to distort God's word by adding to it or by taking away from it or by not fully understanding it, by trusting what other people say is in God's word than digging into it for ourselves, Satan sees the opportunity. He's like, I've got him. And so Satan moves from disputing God's word when he hears Eve distort God's word. Then he goes straight in for the kill. He denies God's word. You will not surely die. It's right there. You see the pattern. You see the sequence. And this isn't in your notes, but when you've got two weeks to work on a sermon, you add stuff. Uh, After that, Satan moves into defaming God's character. He says, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. 
See, he plants the suggestion in Eve's mind that God's holding out on her and Adam, that he's threatened by the idea that they would become like him. Isn't that tragic? Because we know from Scripture that God's greatest desire for the human race is that we would be conformed into the image of His Son. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Do not be conformed to this pattern of, the, of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will of God. Galatians 4, 19 says, I labor, this is Paul talking, I labor until Christ is formed in you. 1 John 3, 2 says, Now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. Shea and Sawyer and the others that were baptized, now you are children of God. And from this day forward, God is making you more and more into his image. So there's going to come a day when you will be like God, for we will see him as he is. Satan says, God doesn't want you to be like him. God says, yes, I do. That's the whole point, conforming you into the image of my son. But the serpent tries to make God, the creator of the universe, sound petty. The suggestion, is he really good? Does he really want what is best for you? Should it really be up to him to decide right and wrong for all of us? The implication is that humans should not be the ones to stand in judgment before a holy God, but that humans should sit in judgment of a holy God. And that's where the sin is. We do that today, don't we? I just don't believe that a loving God would really send people to hell just because they've never heard about Jesus. I just don't believe that a loving God would really send two Category 5 hurricanes into the same area within two weeks of each other. I just really don't believe that a loving God would allow my mom to suffer from cancer. We sit in judgment of God and His character all the time, and it goes back to the garden. So how do we resist this temptation? How do we resist Satan's plan to distort God's word, to dispute God's word, to deny God's word, to defame God's character? We resist temptation by digesting God's word. Psalm 119.11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against God. Delilah Vasquez, when we were getting ready for baptism, she was talking about how in Awana she'd memorized how many verses this week, this year? Delilah, you in here? How many? 56, you go girl. Psalm 119.11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against God. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, that's in Matthew 4, you notice that he countered every temptation from Satan. How? With scripture. Satan said this, Jesus said, it is written. Satan said, do this, Jesus said, it is written. Satan said, bow here, Jesus said, it is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken us that is not common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Students, the way of escape against temptation is to hide God's word in your heart that you might not sin against God. It's not just for cubbies. It's not just for sparkies. Okay, we all have to hide God's word in our heart. There's so many scriptures that compare God's word to a feast, to food, to drink. Amos 8, 11, there's going to come a day when there's a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Psalm 42, as a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul thirsts for you, the living God. In the Psalms, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 119, 103 and 104, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. We feast on God's word. We take in God's word. We I get so marinated in God's word. We get so dripping, wet, saturated with God's word that when we get squeezed, what comes out? God's word. May it be so for Glenwood Baptist Church. I wish it had been that way for Eve, but it wasn't. 
verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Sin never looks the way we expect it to, does it? The tree was desirable. It wasn't ugly. It wasn't wormy. It wasn't drought impacted. It was desirable because God created it and God doesn't make anything ugly. And the devil's never going to make temptation look ugly or sick or scary or damaging. You're never going to see a beer commercial that says you just threw up in a dumpster. It's Miller time. <laughs> Satan's going to make it look good. And you don't get to call a party foul just because sin has negative consequences and you thought it was going to be so good. It's like a Geico commercial. When you're Satan, you make sin look good. It's what you do. And we like to blame Eve, don't we? We like to think it's her fault that sin came into the world. But do you remember what I asked you to pay attention to when we looked at Genesis 2 in the previous set of scriptures? To whom were the instructions given? Adam. Now, look closely at this verse. While Eve was having a conversation with a talking snake, where was Adam? Right there with her. And he ate. Friends, hear this. The most dangerous creature in the garden that day was not a legless serpent, but a spineless man. The most dangerous creature in the garden that day was not a legless serpent, but a spineless man. Adam heard the instructions from God, from God himself. It was his job to lovingly share that with his wife. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. He was right there with him, with her, in the garden. And apparently he said nothing. Men, lead your wives. 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. That's in the King James, it says, according to knowledge, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. And it goes on to say, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Men, do you sometimes feel like your prayers are just hitting the ceiling and bouncing off? Maybe you're not leading your wife in an understanding way. Maybe you're not, according to Ephesians 5.25, sanctifying her, cleansing her with the washing of water from the word. Men... I'm going to thump on you. It is our responsibility to be the spiritual leaders in our household. And if you co-opt that to your wife, you're not leading her. And that goes back to the garden. The most dangerous creature was not the legless serpent. Because the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than the one who is in the world. Satan has no power over us that we don't let him get. First Peter says, resist the devil. I'm sorry, that's James. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. No, the most dangerous creature was the man who said nothing. So let's look at the effects of sin. First, there's shame. The eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. When we are confronted with our sin, we are ashamed. It's one of the first emotions that an infant feels. If you're psychology, you know that the first crisis that Erickson identified was autonomy versus shame and doubt. It's the first negative emotion that a young child experiences is shame. Second is isolation. Genesis 3.10, when God says, Adam, where are you? Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. One of the most devastating effects of sin is that in our shame, we cut ourselves off from community. Satan convinces us that the truth will destroy us and we hide. Jesus said the truth will make us free. Satan says the truth will kill us. A few years ago, Ashley Madison, the um, adultery facilitation website, was hacked. And thousands of men who had signed up for the service suddenly had their names and their email addresses for public consumption. My brother Alan will tell you that the hardest funeral service he ever preached was for a colleague of his at the Baptist Seminary. 
whose name was on that list. When the story broke, he took his life. The lie that the enemy will tell you is that the truth will lead to your destruction. John 8.32 says the truth will make you free. Dr. Gibson's son stood up in front of a seminary congregation and he talked about his dad and this is what he said. The enemy says that vulnerability brings shame, shows weaknesses, kills relationships. The truth is that vulnerability is the way for sin to be atoned for, weakness to be made strength, and relationships to be make nurtured. But Adam hid in his shame. Men, women, are we hiding in our shame? What we try to cover, God will expose. But what we expose before God in community, God will cover. Adam didn't do that. Adam played the blame game. Actually, all of them did. Eve did. Adam did. God said, what is it that you've done? The man said, the woman you put here with me, it's not my fault, it's her fault. The, or actually, it's your fault, God. You put her here. The woman you put here with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate. The Lord said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Adam blames God, woman blames the devil. No one blames themselves. What you don't see with Adam and Eve, confession, repentance, ownership. What made David a man after God's own heart? David committed adultery, David committed murder. And yet, when he was confronted by the prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel 12, he says, I've sinned against the Lord. Psalm 51 is his prayer of confession. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions and wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know that my transgressions and my sin is ever before you. Against you, you only, have I failed and done what is evil in your sight so that you may prove, be proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Cleanse me and I will be white, clean. Wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. Listen to all of the words there. Have mercy, blot out, wash away, cleanse me, wash me, create in me a pure heart, renew a steadfast spirit, restore me, guide me. And the promise from God's word is that he will. He may not reverse the consequences that your sin has set in motion, but he will forgive you if you allow yourself to be forgiven and if you don't buy into the temptation of Satan to destroy yourself when your sin is uncovered what we try to cover God will expose what we expose before God and before our community God will cover because friends there is a curse there are consequences to sin and we're going to look at that but there is the reversal to those consequences and I want us to look at that too we're going to skip around a little bit because I want you to get this one first Satan, Jesus, uh, God says to Satan, to the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Now what, you, what follows in verses 14 through 19 is really God's judgment on uh, the serpent, the woman, the man, creation itself. And it's possible to look at this and think, wow, this is harsh. All this for a little piece of fruit. But the truth is, it wasn't just a piece of fruit. Once human beings made the decision that they could decide for themselves what was good and evil and what was right and wrong, essentially, they fired God. They said, hey, thanks for the garden. Your services are no longer required. Got a jet. And off they go. And we do the same thing today. 
And when that happens, when we fire God as the ultimate authority on what is right and wrong, you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. It's going to permeate everything, creation, relationships, man, woman, decisions, judgments. Everything is permeated when we fire God as the authority of right and wrong, and we try to do that ourselves. Why should we still take the blame for what people did in the garden thousands of years ago? I didn't bite the fruit. Yes, you have. We all have. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but the truth is you don't need the Bible to tell you that. You know that. You look at your own life and you say, I'm a good person. I was in the Boy Scouts. I was an Eagle Scout. I come to church. I've not broken any laws. I put money in the Salvation Army kettle. I cry at Hallmark movies. I'm a good person. You see what you did there? You said, it's up to me to decide that I'm a good person. I don't need the Bible to tell me that my righteousness is as filthy rags. I don't need the Bible to tell me that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I don't need the Bible to tell me that the wages of sin is death. I'm okay. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not information, but determination. And we all do that. But here's what God says. See, God began making a way, way back in Genesis 3, for our sin to be forgiven. We're going to break down the specific parts of the curse that God placed on all of us, but I want us to look first at Genesis 3.15. This is what really smart people who like big words call the proto-evangelium, or the first gospel. The first messianic prophecy is right here in verse 15. I've, I've put it on New King James because of that word, seed. Other translations say offspring. But there's over 200 uses of this word seed in the Old Testament. And every time God is talking to someone about their seed, guess what? He's talking to a man. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word is actually sperma. So it would be unheard of to speak to a woman about her seed unless there wasn't a man involved in the birth. There's been one birth in all of history that was the seed of the woman, and that was Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, born without the inheritance of this sin nature. And so way back at Genesis 3.15, God begins making plans for the redemption of humanity when he says, there's going to be one born that's the seed of the woman. And devil, he's going to crush your head. Because look what happens. You, serpent, you will bruise him on the heel. That's a wound. It's a bad wound. But you can recover from that. Jesus was crucified for the sins of the world. It was a bad wound. By his stripes we are healed. Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. It wasn't a fatal wound. But that one that whose heel you bruised, he's going to crush your head, devil. He's going to defeat the power of sin and death, and he will crush your head. You see the passion of the Christ way back when? One of the things that Mel Gibson kind of threw in there that I just, I loved this image. After Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, a serpent crawls out from the bush. And as Jesus gets up after sweating drops of blood for our sin and for what he's going to face on the cross, Jesus looks at that serpent and says... And when I saw the Passion of the Christ the first time, we were in a theater that had been rented out by an African-American church. And I loved it because as soon as that happened, this woman on row three said, That's my Jesus! (laughs) The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet, is what Romans 16, 20 says. And there's going to come a day when every part of the curse in Genesis is going to be reversed. All right? 
quickly, I want us to look at the ways the curse is reversed. In Genesis 3.16, God speaking to the woman says there's going to be pain and childbearing. I'll make your pains very severe. With painful labor, you give birth to children. All the mamas in here are going, thanks, Eve, right? But look at what happens in 1 Timothy 2, 13 through 15. Paul says that Adam was for, formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. Yeah, he was, Paul. But the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing. This isn't saying that in order to be saved, you've got to have kids. What this is saying is that the woman will have a child who will save us from our sins. Pain and childbearing saved through childbearing. Uh, unfulfilled desire to the woman and a husband's dominion. Verse 16, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Women are created and designed to be vulnerable, to, be, to give more of their love. Men are hardwired to be more analytical, more stoic, less emotional. And the curse is pronounced that there's going to be days when the woman desires the husband and the husband withholds love in an unkind way, in a cruel way, in a manipulative way. And that's part of the curse. But there's going to come a day in Revelation 21 of fulfilled desire because you're not under your husband's dominion, you're under God's dominion. Revelation 21, I heard a loud voice from, heaven, from the throne saying, the dwelling place of God is with man, he will dwell with them, they will be his, his people, God himself will be with them as their God, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain for the former things have passed away. Then God turns to Adam and he says, there's going to be painful toil for food. We're going to curse the ground, uh, and through painful toil, you'll eat food from it all the days of your life. See, sometimes we think that work is a result of the curse. God gave Adam work to do before the fall. Work is not a curse. But painful toil, the sweat of the brow, it wasn't supposed to be this hard. And God said, that's a result of the curse, but there's going to come a day in Revelation 22, that the tree of life will yield 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree will be for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. From painful toil to a year-round harvest where we don't have to work so hard anymore. The tree of life forbidden. In Genesis 3, 17, God said the man's now become like one of us, knowing good and evil, must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from it the tree of life and eat and live forever. Again, this sounds harsh, but understand the grace here. Man is now fallen. He's separated from God. And God says the worst thing that could happen would be if he lived forever in a fallen state. If he takes hold of the tree of life now and lives forever, then he lives forever apart from any chance of redemption. And I love him so much, I don't want that to happen. Because you know what? That's the definition of hell. We will live forever in one of two places. And if we reject God all of our lives, then finally God will say, okay, you wanted to be separate from me? You got it. Forever and ever. C.S. Lewis says there's two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those that uh, God says to them in the end, thy will be done. But God did not want to see us separated from him forever, so he barred access to the tree of life. But there's going to come a day, Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. How did they wash their robes? In Revelation chapter 7, God shows John a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God. And John asked the angel, Who are these? And the angel says, These are the ones who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood 
of the Lamb. That's how our robes get washed in the blood of the Lamb. And for those who wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb, instead of having the gate blocked, which is part of the curse in verse 24, there's going to come a day in Revelation 21, 25, where the gates are never shut and there will be no night and we will all have access to the tree of life. How does that happen? How do we reverse the curse of original sin? God gives us one more hint in verse 21. Maybe it feels like a little bit of a throwaway line because it's just kind of in there. Verse 21, the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. That may seem like not, just, not such a big deal until you realize that this is the first time in Genesis that there's any mention of blood being shed. For Adam and Eve's nakedness to be covered, for their shame to be covered, God killed an animal and made skin for them, made clothes for them out of its skin, and covered the man and woman's shame. But something had to die. Because Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness for sin. And once more in Genesis 3, God is pointing us to the day when there's going to be a lamb that was slaughtered, a sinless, spotless, perfect lamb. And by the shedding of his blood, our sins will be forgiven. Friends, maybe you came this morning to find out questions about how we were going to respond to what one person might have done. This morning, I want to ask you to respond to what you've done. You don't have to look elsewhere to see the effects of sin in the world. You can look in the mirror. And this morning, the truth that was there for Adam and Eve, the truth that was there for David, is the truth that's here for us. Repent. Turn away from your sin. Ask the Lord to blot out your transgression. Ask the Lord to wash away your iniquity. And you can be washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. If you've never heard the gospel, it began in Genesis. It continues through John. It goes into the book of Revelation. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And you can walk out of here forgiven. Will you come? Pray with me. As our musicians come back up, in the quietness of this moment, I want to ask you, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb, in the precious blood of the Lamb? Because without Him, you can do nothing. Father God, speak to us now. If there is somebody here that does not have a relationship with you. I pray that they have heard something in this hour that has made a difference in their eternity and that this morning they could walk out of here forgiven, spotless, clean, and whole. Continue to speak to us now in the name of Jesus. Amen.